My name is Trevor Townsend. I'm the head of the Department of um, Civil and Environmental Engineering, Faculty of Engineering, UE. And we would be very happy to have you participating in this very interesting webinar entitled Gender Equality in Engineering, Contextual Support and Barriers to Career Choice. So just to give a bit of a background to the, the webinar, we know that engineering is perhaps one of the most male dominated professions of the world. And for decades to attract more women to the field, engineering educators have focused on things like curriculum reform, um, interest, you know, promoting girls' interest in math and science and other such activities. And while these efforts have brought more women to study engineering, it seems that many quit during or just after school. And maybe the issue lies past the concept of just the preliminary education. So we need to be acknowledging the problem. I'm looking at how we deal with communication, respect, and breaking of old traditions as we attempt to grow our society as a society and embrace gender equality. So today's webinar aims to have these kind of conversations about topics such as why choose engineering, topics such as the role of mentorship. And we want to speak on some interventions that we could use in tackling unconscious bias of gender inequality in the engineering profession. We have with us today as our main moderator, Dr. Jennifer Jones Morales. And um, Dr. Jennifer Jones Morales is a graduate from the University of the West Indies. She holds a PhD in business administration with a focus on the impact of gender on authentic leadership in Caribbean business. So she is very well qualified to be the main moderator in this session. Dr. Jones Morales also holds an MBA from the Ivy Business School at Western Ontario, Canada. She has two decades of service at the United Nations, International Labour Organization, Decent World Team and Office of, for the Caribbean. And she currently sits on the First Citizens Advancement for Women Committee. She's a member of the board of the Family Planning Association of Trinidad Tobago. And um, when she has time after all of those things, she's the deputy chair of the Lydian Singers. So welcome once again. And I now turn you over to our main moderator, Dr. Jennifer Jones Morales. Thank you, Dr. Tongzen, for your very kind introduction. So good afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, esteemed panelists, and to all the listening and viewing participants here in Trinidad and Tobago and abroad. It is indeed an honor and privilege for me to moderate this afternoon's proceedings on this very important topic of gender inequality. Today's webinar, as said by Dr. Tongzen, is entitled Equality in Engineering, Contextual Support, and Barriers to Career Choice. The genesis of this webinar is the brainchild of Dr. Leon, Lee Leon, lecturer in highway engineering here at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus. As he was faced with some of the young female engineers who were feeling as if they had no place on the construction site, but should have been um, deployed to project offices. Well, I would like to first congratulate the Department of Engineering, not only for hosting this round table, but also for recognizing that both men and women have a role to play in addressing gender issues and to find ways to eradicate gender inequality. So the aim of today's session is to unpack the notion of gender inequality, as well as to speak on interventions in tackling the unconscious bias of inequality. This is the first of a series of webinars on the topic of gender issues. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point in our history, every global citizen's mind is enraptured by the horrors of the COVID-19 pandemic. But let us not for a moment lose sight of the fact and step back to another global nightmare, which is gender inequality. According to the Human Development Report of 2019, one of the most entrenched forms of inequality is gender inequality, as it is one of the greatest barriers to sustainable human development. Before we get down to brass tacks, permit me at this stage to define some of the concepts for you 
amongst them gender and gender equality. Do you know that there's a difference between sex and gender? And this is oft times misunderstood in the Caribbean forum. Professor Eudine Barito, principal of the Cave Hill campus, she offers a social constructionist definition of gender. And I quote, she says, it is a complex set of systems of personal and social relations through which women and men are socially created and maintained, through which they gain access to and are allocated status, power, and material resources within society. Gender, therefore, can be considered to be a continuum of characteristics which individuals of each sex can demonstrate. Here we are talking about gender role expectations, where men are described as agentic or dominant, and women are seen as more communal or nurturing or caring, and sometimes even described as weak. When we refer to gender equality, the United Nations and the World Health Organization, they defined it as, and I quote, as the absence of discrimination on the basis of persons, sex, in opportunities, the allocation of resources and benefits, or access to services. Because we are dealing with engineering disciplines this evening, you will, this afternoon, sorry, you will hear us referring to the importance of STEM education, that is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, which has also expanded to include the arts, and it's called STEAM and even research and reading called STREAM. So in a 2018 study of the International Labor Organization, it's a study on women in business and management in the Caribbean, it was found that despite overall gains in education, women were less likely than men to complete degrees in STEM. Why is this? This is due to the fact that there are traditional gender stereotypical roles that are suited to men. In addition, the workplace in STEM fields may also be, as was said before, a male-dominated corporate culture. And this perception serves to deter women from choosing to embark on a STEM career path. From this study, trends also show that female STEM graduates have increased in Aruba and Guyana, but it has decreased in Bermuda and in Antigua and Barbuda. And so the STEM gender divide continues to be perpetuated. It is also heartening to note, however, that in 2019, the University of Trinidad and Tobago reported that in its 15 year history, it recorded its highest number of female students who graduated from education programs, process and utilities engineering, mechanical engineering, and communications and technology programs. Allow me to touch briefly on our history of colonialism, which has resulted in the formation of the patriarchy, and this coexists in a system of matrifocal families. Unfortunately, these systems have deep-rooted inequalities, which are still present up to today. Ladies and gentlemen, cultural perceptions coupled with internalized value systems and mores can result in unconscious biases and reaffirm gender stereotypes. Socialization in gender specific roles in the workplace start from as early as kindergarten or at the Montessori level, and they go so all the way up to the university life and beyond. Even though the progress on closing the gender gaps has stalled worldwide, I am very pleased to say that according to the Gender Gap Report 2020, which looks at four major areas, economic participation and opportunity, educational attainment, health and survival, and political empowerment between, Trinidad, um, between men and women, Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, and Barbados fared very well amongst 153 countries. So Trinidad and Tobago ranked 24th with an average of 0.756. Barbados came four places behind with an average of 0 .7, 0 0.749, and Jamaica came in at number 41 with an average of 0.735. But what does all of this mean? It means that the highest score, which was made by Iceland, was 0.877. In my view, in order to change the present trajectory of stymied progress, policy choices and decision making must have gender equality at their core. In addition, organizations must be mindful that in order to strategically pivot, 
they would have to pay attention to the special needs of women, as we are the caregivers. Women should not be penalized because of motherhood. Neither should we be subjected to lower and unequal pay, occupational segregation, and violence and harassment in the workplace, which gave rise to the Me Too movement and the Ni Unos Menos movement in Argentina. Just yesterday, the ILO released its publication called the Global Wage Report 2020 to 2021, Wages and Minimum Wages in the Time of COVID-19, which said that when looking at a selection of European countries for women, the total wage bill declined by 8.1% for women compared to a decline of 5.4% for men. But what is interesting to note is that the discrepancy was caused by reduced working hours, more than by the difference in the number of layoffs. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, when we had the lockdowns, more women had to take time off of their work to take care of the children while they were at home. So I am joined today by three accomplished speakers who will help us untangle the many webs of gender equality in engineering. They are here with a breadth of experience as engineers. They're, they are a diverse group from junior to senior engineer, from local to international background, and they have a wealth of international exposure in the foreign arena. The first of these three powerhouses is Ms. Engina Binta Trotter. Engineer Trotter is a registered structural engineer who graduated with a BSc in civil engineering from the University of the West Indies and a master's in civil engineering from Cornell University. She is also a chartered engineer whose specialties are structural design and retrofit of building structures. She has taught at the University of Trinidad and Tobago and here at the University of the West Indies. Ms. Trotter has previously served as a committee member of the Civil Division of the Association of Professional Engineers and was the project coordinator for the i struct e design and build competition. The lone male amongst us is Dr. Ryan Allard. Dr. Allard received his PhD and MSc in Transportation Systems Analysis from the University of Lisbon in Portugal and a BS at Aerospace Engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, familiarly known as MIT. He's a transportation analyst with broad knowledge of transportation systems and their impact on our climate. Dr. Allard works as a consultant, aiding in the development of more effective government and state agencies. Finally, here to illuminate the discussion is Ms. Jovina Demo. Ms. Demo is a Temple University graduate who has been working with Atkins as an aviation engineer. Javina's aviation background includes coordinating the airfield design efforts for a runway reconstruction project at Northeast Philadelphia Airport and a taxiway reconstruction project at Philadelphia International Airport, both of which are currently undergoing construction. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to listen to these three distinguished panelists in their own rights. Finally, firstly, sorry, we will discuss their perspectives on gender equality, followed by a 30 minute conversation on four specific themes, engineering careers, workplace challenges, jobs in engineering, and the importance of mentorship. We will then have the question and answer segment which will be coordinated by Ms. Lalini Telemach and Dr. Leo. And I will join the members of the panel at that time. Questions will be taken on this platform, so please take advantage of this opportunity and place your questions in the chat. Kindly keep the questions short though, because time is limited. I thank you in advance for that. So let us move on to the panelists. Welcome panelists. Hello, thanks for having us. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Our first question is to you all, why does gender inequality persist? And I would start with Ms. Demo. 
So I think there is ultimately, I think gender inequality comes down to two reasons and that's, um, or two challenges, which is recruitment of engineers in the field and retention. So we want to bring women in and we also want to keep the women in the field that we have. Um, you know, the, I, I truly believe that the more women that we have working together in this profession, the more inviting it will become in the future. Um, women are a growing part of this world's population, but it's, you know, the participation in engineering is, is underwhelming. There are efforts to, uh, to encourage the entry of women in the workforce, but the significant challenge to recruit and retent th these, uh, these talent is nobody has ever found a solution to this because I think there is no solution unless we all come together and have discussions like this. Um, and I can admit that before this, uh, this discussion, I actually analyzed my own self in my everyday you know, working routine. And I picked up on a lot of unconscious ways in which you know, bias exists. Even in the, even an example, like such a simple example, not sure if you guys ever, or sorry, like I, I just did it myself. If you've ever received an email and the email says, hey guys, even though it might be directed to multiple people in, in the profession. So something so simple that's just instilled to be, uh, like it's, it's instilled in us at a really young age. And I also think, you know, stereotypes have a lot to do with, um, with, with the recruitment process of engineers. Uh, you know, at a young age, we are taught, you know, girls will play with uh, the kitchen set and boys will build, you know, buy, have building materials and stuff like that. So I do think it's, uh, it has to do with recruitment and retention. That's, you know, it's, it's really challenging. Um, I re research shows that on our current trend, it's, it will take us 217 years to close the global gender pay gap. So this is a statistic that we really do need to remember the next time that someone tells us that, you know, it, things are better than they used to be. Things might be better, but things are, you know, this is a really big challenge that it needs a, a collaboration on everybody's part. Um, you know, despite this progress, the engineering workplace is, is a very trying experience. We face bias, stereotypes, um, which then leads to disadvantages in hiring, in pay promotions, in performance evaluations uh, and mentoring and, and leadership opportunities. So I, I, I think it, it is a uh, recruitment and retention is, uh, is one of the reasons or two of the reasons. Okay, thank you for sharing that. I will then pass you on to the man in the middle, Dr. Allen. <laughs> what are your Hello, thoughts everyone. on gender inequality and why does it persist? Yes, thank you. Good day, everyone. Um, so the data show that women, girls, are actually interested in math and science and engineering when they're young, right? So some of them get access to toys that are encouraging them to explore that interest. Um, many of them do not, just like um, Ms. Dino said. And I think part of that is the culture we have around the world today that girls play with certain types of toys and boys play with different toys. But even if that interest persists up to the level of, let's say, going to college, there's this perception that, you know, women don't go into some of these more um, engineering focused uh, fields of engineering. So there's a, a trend of pushing girls away from those fields. And then even in engineering degrees, engineering schools, the culture, let's be honest, is designed for men by men, right? Historically, it's been like that for, for a very long time. And it's, it turns away many young women from continuing these degrees in engineering or continuing in the field after they've left. Now this is bad clearly, as was mentioned several times earlier, but it's, it's also bad from the perspective of institutions that need engineers, right? So think about all the women that go through these degrees that actually have the talent, they have the skills, they have the training, but they don't feel comfortable in these careers because of the culture, because of the the disparities in pay because of other issues that we'll discuss today. And what ends up happening is that they end up leaving. So this is a loss to the engineering profession. It's a loss to the development of, of output from engineers. And what ends up happening is that the society loses completely. All right? So I think it's important for us to look at the bigger picture here today, which is how can society benefit how can we encourage more women to enter and stay in engineering? How can we make the, 
the environment that they're in more comfortable for them? And how can we convince maybe leadership in different institutions to make that change, right? To encourage that environment to be more welcoming for women and all people with skill and interest in engineering. And when you think about the perspective from women also, it also encourages them to reach their highest potential, all right? Because obviously, if you really want to do engineering, science, technology, math, and you don't feel comfortable expressing your skills, your knowledge, et cetera, then you aren't able to fully achieve what they call your highest potential, right? So your, your self-actualization, right? So I think there's a lot of steps in this, and I think we need to come to this with a very open mind on both sides and multiple sides, you know, just as men against women here, it's different levels of different perspectives that we need to bring here. And I think we need to be open when we have this discussion, right? To put yourselves in the shoes of somebody else who might have a, uh, let's say a different perspective from you. How might they think of this challenge and what might they be seeing as an option or not an option and why that is? So I think I'm looking forward to the discussion today, thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Allard. So let me pass on to Ms. Trotter. And if you can share your views on gender inequality um, as a senior engineer, and we're looking forward to you to, to tell us all about life as an engineer, because you, you've straddled the, the, the course and you're still here. So and as a senior engineer, could you tell us, um, firstly, whether you think that gender inequality exists in engineering from your experience or your colleagues' experiences, and, and what are some of the reasons? Okay, thank you very much for inviting me, Lee. And um, I mean, it's a really interesting discussion. I, I'm gonna go out on a limb a little bit and probably have a slightly different perspective. And it's interesting because, I mean, I, I think for a long time, I did not really think consciously about the impact and, you know, how gender affects um, progress. Um, as I've, I've expressed to the group before, I was born in 1976. A prime minister of Dominica, Dame Eugenia Charles, came into power in 1980. For my whole of my youth, from 4 to 19, I've seen women in leadership. And it wasn't odd. I mean, she was a very dynamic leader it, and it wasn't, it didn't seem strange. And I think for women and girls who grew up, because I grew up in Dominica, for women and girls who grew up in Dominica in the 80s and 90s, I think seeing women in that role really, I mean, it's not something, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's well studied, but I certainly don't think a lot of my peers would, would had the experience where they felt as if they could not achieve what they wanted to achieve. Um, I had a, I have I had very strong women role models in my life. Even, you know, my, my grandparents, my, my grandmother, they were all very strong, independent women. So, and I, and I also had a good role model as a father. I had a loving, caring father who taught us respect. So growing up, I saw women as equal, men and women as equal, equally deserving of respect and opportunity, but different. Differences to be appreciated and respected. And to be honest, I did not perceive the behavior of boys and men as threatening as, as a young person growing up. And my experience has been that, and, and I cannot speak for other regions, but within CARICOM, I believe that women, there is no, I haven't seen a lot of evidence in the last, say, 20 years of gender inequality in terms of access to education. There are social cultural realities where women and women and boys are sort of um, girls, sorry, girls and boys are, are probably encouraged to pursue slightly different, you know, probably girls are not as encouraged as much. But generally speaking, I think right through secondary school up to the tertiary level, even when I was teaching at university, my experience had been my experience was that women were comfortable pursuing engineering. They had a slightly different perspective, they approached problems probably differently but they were quite comfortable pursuing the profession. And throughout my career, I've been lucky to work at companies that have been really, really supportive. And I don't think that's the, that, was, that, that happens for all women. But my experience has been that generally speaking, in terms of access to education, we've made really good strides. Mean, I'm sure there are situations that are not less than ideal, but we've made, you know, we've done well, yeah? 
I think where it gets complicated is when you try, when you're trying to build a career and um, there are there, there are situations where perhaps gender plays a role. I mean, Lee spoke about it before. Well, in, in discussions with Lee, we talked a little bit about some of the challenges women face early in their careers. I think women often pursue that perceived as weak, too sensitive, they're sometimes undervalued, and, and the complications of family life um, and, and raising a family and the, the social roles women have also you know, make things a little complicated. So I think what happens is that as women try to progress in their careers, there are situations where perhaps the inequality starts to show up in, 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 in slightly different ways, ways that is not quite obvious if you don't look very clear, carefully. Thank you very much, Ms. Trotter, and thank you, panelists. So basically what I'm hearing is, is really, we had three different perspectives on the gender inequality issue. Um, not only from, from the role of uh, men or women, but basically what are the issues, incl including the cultural context, including um, the recruitment and retention and, and Dr. Allen talking about the complexity of it all. And I think it is important that we try to distill in a very systematic ways what the issues are, because what we have already seen is a big um, pot of Kalaloo, if you want to, to be graphic, of issues that we can't all deal with in, in one fell swoop. And this is why it's important to understand that this has to be a continuing discussion on what are some of the issues. Um, so let's, let's move on to really then, what are your perspectives on this webinar topic, which is gender equality in engineering, the contextual support, but more importantly, the barriers to career choice. I would like you all to unpack that a little bit because there are several parts to the question. Do you see e gender equality as attainable in engineering? And this time I will start with the lone man. <laughs> Dr. Allard, over to you. Thank you, yes. So I think, um, generally I think there's a lot of potential, although we've made a lot of progress in the past, just as, as Ms. Trotter mentioned. Um, I think the, the barriers are, very, are generally subtle in the Caribbean, right? Because in the Caribbean, I think the culture here encourages women to express themselves generally, you know, not specifically in engineering necessarily, but it's about women's empowerment. It's, it's, it's part of the culture we have. When you listen to the music we have, when I listen to um, how we talk about strong women in the Caribbean, and all these kinds of things come together to promote women to be strong. And that, that I think, makes the issue very subtle, because although we have that on one hand, we still have these situations where the number of women entering the field is very low. The number of women staying in yes. the field is very low. So I think the issue really is, is very subtle. It's also um, something that, because of that subtlety, is very hard to, to identify it in the real workplace, even in the, in the academic environment. And I think it's, it's going to take a lot of, I don't know if you want to use the term soul searching, but it, it's going to take a lot of deep thinking about how individually leadership in these institutions, whether it's academia or it's companies or it's government, have contributed to the challenge and whether we are individually doing enough. And as you mentioned, Dr. Drew Morales, the policy can encourage that, right? Encourage the elucidation of what the issues are and actions that individuals take that, of course, when you aggregate everything, it turns into society's culture, right? But it's individual actions that lead to these issues, right? So it might be a woman who is experiencing subtle comments from her male engineering co-students, right? That might suggest that she's not capable of doing something, whereas she, she has full capability, right? Um, but it's a comment which attacks her psyche, right? So that, that might stay in her head for a long time, and then, you know, over time, she thinks herself less worthy to be an engineer, right? That's a very, very subtle thing that's very hard to tease out and actually affect. 
Um, certainly there are things like the kind of advising that they get. Now I have no data on that because these are private discussions, right? But I would imagine, and I would hope that there's some data on that presented today, but I would imagine that there are different types, there might be some subtle differences in the discussions that um, advisors or leaders in companies have with their female engineers versus male engineers. That would be something for us to look into also. And I think also the big question, of course, of family, of uh, where child rearing, right? So that's a very challenging one because it's a biological fact, right? So it's not something that we can change, but it is something that we can respect, right? So I think of it as there are many other dimensions of human variability that we can look at. We can have a similar discussion, right? It could be about, of course, race, national origin, and all these other types of ways that we tend to classify people and judge them, unfortunately. And I think... But if, if, I, may, we, if I may interject here, Dr. Allen, yes. I think one of the things that we also need to look at, if you are talking about a, a disconnect between those the girls in school and when they, whether or not they go on to be engineers, I think it means or it suggests that we also have to look at what the curricula are and who are responsible, what their vision is. Is it that these um, educators, the educators have to recalibrate their minds to look differently at the curricula so that they are encouraged to make that leap from school into the profession um, and, and kind of work within the subtleties that you alluded to in your, in your discourse. Right. I think, that, I think that it's something that we need to look at as well. Yeah, that, that could be interesting because to some extent the curricula is dependent on, on you know, what, what the field needs, right? So we've heard, for instance, many years of of companies saying, oh, we need engineers that have these certain skills, right? To some extent, you're kind of meeting what the market says you need to meet, right? But at the same time, there should be some, some ability of the academic institutions to define what's needed as a thinking engineer or thinking scientist or mathematician, whatever the field is. But for engineering, it certainly is the case. So I can imagine that if we have an issue of not enough women feeling comfortable to enter or continue in that field, then there could be some tweaks to the, to the um, curriculum that encourage that. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you have a different class. It could mean that you have some activities that support the academic classes that encourage them to, to feel comfortable. Maybe it's, I believe some universities, for instance, mention having uh, their conferences for female engineers only in the US, for instance. Right, so they encourage all the female engineers to engineering students to attend these events. Right, so they see women in, in high engineering positions, they get comfortable with the idea of themselves becoming or emulating those women. Right, so that's right. another way you don't necessarily have to change the, the curriculum, but you can still encourage the, the training, the social training that the students receive to progress them towards that successful career. Okay, and, and I want to move right into Ms. Demo um, to speak to the topic um, of this um, round table and what are her views uh, from an international perspective. So um, when it comes to, to challenges, I think that some of the challenges that I have evaluated, um, one of them is, uh, I'm going to call it hidden motives, right? Like Gender inequality in engineering has become such a, you know, such a major topic and discussion. So much money is going into research and uh, finding ways to figure out how to get more women involved. And I feel like a lot of corporations um, are taking advantage of that. And they're, they, all they want to do is they want to fund um, society of women engineering, for example, but they don't really want to do anything about it. They think that by just funding it, they can put their, you know, their logo on, um, on that, you know, the society will say, oh, this person is helping. Um, From a stump. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, but they don't do anything about it. They think that that's enough. They think that by just funding these organizations that they as a company are, are doing enough. And I think that's a problem because, you know, that means that you're not really taking the time to understand what, like, you know, how we can um, fix these challenges. Um, I think that in traditionally, a male work environment, we face bias that force us to constantly monitor and adjust our behavior. 
we have to we have to display the right level of femininity while also having to be wary of the behaviors traditionally associated with masculinity. So we are less likely than men to, to behave assertively or, sh or to show anger without pushback. So, you know, that's a major challenge that I think um, exists. And I, I can say that I have witnessed that myself. Um, I think that as a woman in engineering, if you speak up, then you're just looked at differently versus if you just sit there are quiet and you take notes. Um, also, I think that one of the biggest challenges is dealing with, uh, with a boys club atmosphere, um, which is basically trying to figure out how to fit in into this predominantly male culture. Um, and it's filled, I mean, this, these environments are filled with gender bias and it can increase conflicts um, both internally within a woman uh, because they, they don't know it, but they're unconsciously uh, making us feel like it's limited opportunities for women to advance. So like whenever an another woman joins the organization, you can't help but to feel like a tug of war action. You know, it's, we're made to feel that there's not enough opportunities for more women to come in. So this also, I think um, this women who have faced discrimination in their careers because of this issue will distance themselves from other women that are coming in and they will also, uh, because of discrimination that they have faced, they will perpetuate bias by holding uh, women to higher standards than men. Like we ourselves do that too. So I think this is all like, you know, part of the challenges that arise and it's, it's, it's all unconscious. You know, it's not that these, uh, these careers are filled with, you know, people actually being physically discriminatory. It's just, it's unbiased behavior that leads to these feelings and that's why this there's like a, a gender gap like you know the gap is always increasing so i i think that's another challenge um and like i said like the stresses of uh i think even after overcoming hurdles so once we are in the profession um i think women you know don't i think women quit the jobs of engineering because of the stress that comes with being female in a male dominated field like the stress can be uh, quite overt, like when women face instances of gender discrimination or harassment, um, but it can also be very subtle. Like when we feel that our contributions are less valued than the male peers um, because tasks and roles have been gendered. Like yes, uh, yes. They, that, that this exists too. And I can, I've noticed a, a pattern in this too. Um, I've noticed that women, women that are the women engineers that do have a high role, which are very few in a company, they don't necessarily hold the high role of a technical project manager. Uh, I've seen their roles be more of like the managing director, you know, of engineering and stuff like that. So, I think that unconsciously, mentors might be putting women into fields where it's it's not really high up and technical, but they think that because you know we're good in communication. Um, they might, you know, pass. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, thanks for sharing that. I want to bring Ms. Trotter into the conversation um, by posing a, a, a specific question where we talk about the barriers that women face. And I know you are a mother. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, what has been your experience in terms of you know, being a mother, how does, how does, has that worked out um, for you and in terms of acceptance by your, your male colleagues? Um, and if at all, at any one point in time, you felt pressure when you were, you know, uh, it, during pregnancy? Um, <clears throat> I mean, it's interesting because I think one of the things that, that, that because I, because of the way I grew up, I didn't perceive there were going to be any real barriers to progress. I really decided early in my career that there's absolutely no barrier that I do think I can overcome, right? So what happened when I, when, I, when I had my first son, I was quite young. I did not at that time think that the reaction to, to a pregnancy was necessarily related to the baby. I think companies, any company, and what often happens is that I think what's difficult to discuss openly and honestly is that company cares, companies care about productivity. 
They want workers who can produce. They want people that are available. They don't want to necessarily have to deal with secondary issues related to how much time off you need to take because of, of a child. No, as a mother, I can tell you, you cannot do it all. You cannot have a baby who's sick. I mean, in my case, I had my, my son had pneumonia, I think when he was about 10 months old and he was sick for two weeks in hospital. I had to be with him. Now, I, you know, it was wonderful that I worked with a company that understood the situation, but I always imagined that if I was working for a contractor who had a very tight deadline, that that would not be an option. And it's not about being a woman. It's about that we live in a society where companies need to make money. They need to have resources that are available to do the work. And, that, and therefore, sometimes decisions about parenting and, and, and family, women have to be conscious of the fact that the impact on your productivity and the impact on your work life is not just a company issue. It's also a, a personal decision. You have to analyze the impact of that. So what I say is that if you're going to be a parent and if you're going to be a good parent, you cannot dedicate the same amount. I mean, you cannot dedicate the same amount of time as a man who does not have the central role of parenting. And if he has more time available to dedicate to his job, he's probably going to do better. And in some ways, I, I, I understand why people it, I understand why probably it's a gender issue, but for me, it's, it's just the reality, right? So what I say is that, okay, it's unequal in the sense that maybe you're gonna be derailed a little bit if you're a parent. <clears throat> so what has to happen is that you have to be strategic about how this is gonna work. You're gonna to have to be competent enough and conscientious enough about your work where people or employers or colleagues gonna see your value that's going to make it worth their while to invest in you, even if you're a parent. That you're gonna to have to put in less time, but more productive time when you're available. And you have to demonstrate high levels of competence. I think in a situation where men are more available to their jobs, they probably will do better. And that is not necessarily explicitly a gender issue. It's just a reality, you know? Um, in situations where I think women sometimes a disadvantage is that you have networks, old networks. Now it's not actually discussed a lot, but men sometimes have these well-established networks that go back to high school. And then they, and it's almost like, I don't know if it's a generational thing. I don't know if the next 20 years is not going to be an issue, but what you find is that there's often sometimes those barriers that exist where somehow those networks work a little better for men than they do for women. And that's what I've observed. But it doesn't necessarily mean that if you do not advocate for yourself, you demonstrate competence, you're conscientious that you're not going to do well. I still, I still think it's possible to do quite well. Thank you for that. And, and ladies and gentlemen um, in the audience, it, it's amazing that we have just even started with the first opening discussion. So we have to move quickly now to the main discussion where we have four points that we're going to discuss as I had articulated earlier. But we want to start with a question of why did these panelists uh, choose engineering? And here I'm going to keep with Ms. Trotter um, as, as the person to first answer this question. Why did she choose engineering as a career? Thank you. I, I, liked, I liked physics and math. I like science. And I thought it was a sensible thing. I thought engineering was quite a sensible profession. So that was it. Did you have role models in your family who was I did. a long science stream or? I did. I mean, I have an uncle who's an engineer. Um, and, you know, I, you know I, I, don't think, I don't think it was a direct result of seeing him as an engineer, but I know that it didn't seem, I didn't, there were no women engineers in my immediate family. But having seen women in leadership, having, having an uncle and other family who had you know, done well in their professions, once I made the decision that, that science, science was, was fun um, and I was able to do it, um, I decided to do engineering. And, and it, 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 is a, I mean, it is a good profession. I enjoy engineering. I certainly do. And, it, and I've been doing it for 20 plus years and I, don't, I think it's always interesting. It, there's always something 
that I could learn and I can grow and it has never stopped. So was there ever a time when you felt as though, why did I make this career choice? I could have done yeah, something I mean, differently. Any, <laughs> the thing about it is that once you start to work, I mean, work is, I mean life is tough. I mean, and, and that's what I tell people. It's not about engineering. And life can be, life can be pretty tough, right? So and in an engineering environment, you have tight deadlines. You often have, um, like, a, like any job, there's situations where you go, I mean, today is not a good day. Yeah? Today is really not a good day. But I think once you, again, I use the word strategic, once you're able to adapt, because sometimes you have to make choices where you say, okay, this is no longer working for me. You're going to do something else. Um, and and what I, one of the things that I want to bring up is that, I mean, there is engineering, but it's also the society you live in. Yeah? We cannot separate ourselves from the society we live in. So I am one of these people who lean into the thinking that there is, no, there, is no, there is no barrier. There are barriers, but the barriers that we can go around under over um, in the Caribbean. I'm not talking about worldwide. I just think within the CARICOM. I mean, that's the region I know fairly well. But I think what happens is that we also have a lot of gender-based violence in the Caribbean. We have a lot. I mean, and it's, it, is, it is chronic. It is, it, I mean, it is devastating. Yeah? And, and as women, we don't only have the challenge of operating in that space, we also operate in a society where, where we worry about those issues. We worry about those issues for not just girls, but for girls and boys. And I think a lot of the discussions around gender, it's not a discussion where we're bringing in enough men and boys. I mean, I'm glad Ryan is here. But I think oftentimes we talk about gender as if men are not part of the discussion, <laughs> as if somehow they're not part of the solution. I mean, the, the, I mean, the idea of respect and courtesy and, and, and the idea that we were equal human beings in, this, in the sight of God was something that was just so obvious to me at a young age. And I would always keep thinking, whenever we have this discussion, I'm like, why, why aren't women doing well? I'm like, well, okay, um, I, I hear that, but maybe we need to have a broader discussion about how women and men actually operate in the same space. Maybe we need to have a discussion about the choices women make because they just, you know, it's not, I mean, a lot of times we hear about why we have unequal numbers of men and women in particular technical fields. And I, I also don't know if we have, a, we really had a, a, enough research as to why that actually is. It may not just be bias. There might be other factors that, that affect that. And, and, and I would like to see, I know a lot of, I mean, I've been lucky to work with a lot of male colleagues who I have deep respect for, who respect women, who respect their competence and respect what they have to offer. And I think, I think we need to start having more conversations, not just separate, but really make, trying to make the workplace work for us. Like, you know, that, that's what I want to add. Okay, um, thanks for sharing. I'll move to Dr. Allard. Why did you choose engineering, engineering. as a career? <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's easy for me. I, I was obsessed since I was small with airplanes. Totally obsessed, right? So you can talk to anybody in my family. They would say I had plane toys of all types, whether it's the Legos, the pictures. I had an architect uncle who would bring me images of special aircraft, you know, so I was really into it. And there's a family joke where apparently I was four years old. My mother was taking me on a trip and we were supposed to get off the airplane, but I didn't want to. I did not want to leave. So I was crying, I was causing a fit, and uh, she had to leave me on the plane, go take all the bags off to the terminal and come back to pick me up, you know, just because I was getting so much trouble, right? So I was just obsessed since I was young. So, you know, when I started to think about careers, somebody suggested, oh, Ryan, you should be a, a pilot. And I thought about it for a bit, pilot, okay, yeah. But then you don't use any creativity. You just follow the rules and when you get to travel, that's great. But you just, you, you don't get to create something. But I wanted to create and build something. So then they said, oh, you should do engineering. I thought about it. Okay, that, that could be cool, yeah. And then I entered engineering. I, many students, when they go to these universities, they, they're not sure exactly which engineering or even which yeah. field. 
I knew exactly what I wanted to do. So I just signed up for aerospace engineering right away, aerospace aeronautical. So that to me was easy. And it's interesting because I think I had, you know, in the Caribbean, we say there are, there are only four careers that a Caribbean parent encourages their children to join, right? It's engineering, law, medicine, or your failure. That's the culture we have here for a long time, which is gladly changing, right? But um, I think in engineering, I had no role models of male or female engineers when I was younger. But I think I did have a bias when I was younger. But I remember when I went into the first year of engineering and, you know, we get into meet all the other students and, you know, we're having these projects. And I remember one time I was in a team of about six students, right, a mixture of both men and women. And one of the women in the team, she brought her own toolkit, right, because she has been clearly engineer for a long time. And it was surprising to me, you know, she has her own toolkit, so she's really into this, you know. And I remember thinking about this, you know, years back, years after, but this happened, you know, when I was in my first year of university. And I remember thinking that I, I had this bias that, well, as a woman, you know, she's an engineer, but is she, is she as, as uh, what's the word, as steeped in this, this obsession with building things as, as some of the male students will. And I suppose I, did, I had that bias which I had to overcome. And of course, you know, by now I'm well over it. So I think my experience has continued with seeing differences, right? So when I did my master's, for instance, we had a small class of about 13 people, one female, one woman in the class. Um, when I did my you know, other research, you know, the number of women, very, very limited. And when they're very confident, they're doing their work, they have their field of focus, but it's very limited. And to go back to what I think, um, I just saw a pop up of one of the questions there. I think it does vary by field too. So I did aerospace engineering. If you go to, we had maybe 40% women, all right? Um, maybe 30, somewhere around there. If you go to the computer science and engineering department, it's, I think now it's much more balanced, but you know, a while back, it would have been maybe only 10%, all right? If you go into environmental engineering, it's close to 50% of women. If you go into, um, I think biomedical engineering is also pretty high. So I think there's some fields where there's a preponderance of women. And I guess we should try to figure out what it is about those fields that's different to some of the other fields like transportation engineering, computer engineering, et cetera. All right? um, something that some research I've seen indicated is that if it's about, if there's a closer link with the field and the society, as you can see the impact on humans, maybe animals, maybe, the, uh, maybe nature, then it attracts more women. Now that's, that's what I've seen. I'm not sure we can discuss that some more today. Mm -hmm. And I suppose once that starts happening, it creates this feedback loop where you have more women advancing, becoming successful, and then bringing in, you know, making it easier for younger women to join Good. and end up having this growth in the numbers of women, right? So my experience has been my obsession since I was young, building things, and um, I would encourage any, any young person, you know, if you enjoy building things, if you enjoy tinkering, it might necessarily be only with the trucks and the, the, the cranes that are sold for boys. It could be even with the dollhouses, right? You like the dollhouse, that's fine, but maybe you want to change the structure of the dollhouse. There's so many ways you can do this and make sure you kids, women, girls, boys are interested. So well, I want to bring in Ms. Demo then into the conversation, being in aviation um, engineering, um, what caused you to, to, to want to be an engine, to become an engineer? And did you always think of the engineering as aviation engineering? So um, I would have to say that my life experiences unconsciously made me choose the engineering role. I, I was born in Albania and both of my parents were engineers, but we migrated to America when I was eight years old. And so, you know, they couldn't be engineers anymore here. And uh, so I can't really ever recall when I knew what they did for a living. So it's not like, you know, I saw their daily life of work as an engineer. I, I was really young, but coming to America, you know, I had the language barrier. I didn't speak English. So um, the one thing that I was good at in elementary school was math because math is an international language. And so I looked at math as kind of like 
you know, like I wasn't good at reading or spelling or, or talking, you know, the English language, but math, I was, I was so good at, it, and that helped me really focus um, my, throughout my elementary school, high school, like all my education on, on math. And so when it came time to figure out what I wanted to do in terms of college, I, I had to, um, I wanted to like go in uh, with a declared major because I heard that if you don't go in a declared, as a declared major, a lot of students get caught up and you know, with all the elective uh, prerequisites that they don't really, you know, they can't really decide on what to do. So it was, it was I, I decided I'm just gonna do engineering, I'm good at math. And um, ironically though, my parents never ever encouraged me into the field. And, um, and I never really experienced what it was like for them working in that field but maybe you know subconsciously then you know it was is it directed me to that path and um and i i wanted to do aerospace engineering um but unfortunately the school that i went to in philadelphia didn't offer that course so i just decided to do civil engineering instead and for my senior design project like my capstone project i focused on a aviation project where it kind of opened the door to um you know to working with uh with airport projects and then that allowed me to get my first job. So I, I would have to say that my life experience ultimately led me to, to be in, like an engineer in this, in this field. Okay, thanks for sharing that. Um, I see time is going. So I wanna move to a specific question on different jobs in engineering. So the question is, what area of engineering, um, academic design, office site, project management, construction, etc., do you see as having the highest level of gender inequality? And for that, I will start this time with um, Dr. Allen. Thanks. So, uh, it's hard for me to see a difference in those fields, in those, uh, those areas. Because I think um, I think I'll let some of the other panelists discuss that. Um, what I do see a difference is, like I hinted to, I hinted at earlier, is the different fields Please, of engineering. Yes. Right? Definitely, there are huge differences there. And um, but you I don't said, see I differences think, in jobs. In the actual, you don't task. see a difference in the different jobs. You know, on the construction site versus the project manager in an office. Um, of course, some, some construction, um, construction no, I haven't, I haven't observed a difference, mm -hmm. but I mean, I can only imagine that there might be some differences there. Okay, I'll hand, yeah. I will pass on then to, to Ms. Demo. So which field of engineering? Um, I can easily answer that. Well, you know, from based on my experience and I can say the construction aspect of engineering is, uh, is I, I, that, that's the one that I'm going to choose because I've, I've gone to construction sites before and, um, and you know, you do feel that, um, that I don't want to say discrimination, but it's, you know, groups of men stop talking when you show up because what, you know, in the construction site is mostly men. So they stop talking um, or, you know, they'll make, you know, comments that are subtle, but you know, you know, it, it's not professional. And I also think that plays a role though, because mostly in the construction side, you're dealing with the construction workers that are building the project and they're not really the professional engineers that, you know, you work with on a day-to-day -day basis, which is why I think that that's a higher level of, um, of, you know, experiencing the, the, um, that, that, uh, discrimination. But what do you do, Ms. Demo? Let's say you alluded earlier to a situation where you may get an email, hey guys, you are not a guy. What do you do? Do you write back saying to the sender, excuse me, but there are girls here? Um, do you pull them aside? Do you just say, this uh, is the life? To be honest, yeah, do do I, I, think, I think that um, I, my experiences in the field have just taught me to go along with it. That's why you kind of just brush it off, which is not good because, you know, good. yeah, but that's an unconscious thing. You know, you learn that I'm not going to be the kind of woman that's going to sit and then complain because I don't want to be perceived as, uh, oh, you know, I'm not going to deal with her because she might do this to me. So you kind of are forced to kind of just shrug it off basically. And, um, and that's, that's, I think one of the challenges that, you know, needs to be discussed. Um, well, women find themselves sometimes in what is known as a double bind. And I think you alluded to it um, in your, your contribution a, a few minutes ago. You see, when you are too 
male for the men, they say that, you know, you, you are too, you're too manly and they call you all sorts of adjectives. But at the same time, when they have you in the feminine role, the gendered feminine role of being nurturing and caring, they have the opportunity or the luxury of saying, well, that you're weak. Um, and then there's the other phenomenon of, okay, so you're in a double bind because some women do not like or appreciate other women who are deemed to have the male dominated stereotypical, stereotypical traits. And, and that is a serious double bind issue. I think the other thing is that um, when you talked a little while earlier was that, okay, it's all well and good. We can talk about women bringing along other women, but then there is on the other side, the queen bee syndrome, which is when some women reach to the top, well, they worked so hard to get there. Well, I'm sorry, I am not carrying anybody. Um, you know, there's, person, yeah. <laughs> so there's always that struggle, you know, um, you know, I had a mentor who said until all of cross, until none of cross, all of cross and some we have to carry, but not all the time women feel that they have to carry um, anybody. So because of their experiences, but I want to hand over now, pass over to Ms. Trotter to speak, to speak to that in terms of what areas of engineering, um, if any, um, did you see any kind of gender inequality? Um, and how did you deal with any kind of action or response from a man that you found, um, you know, inappropriate? Okay, so, I mean, when, you, when we use the word inequality, I mean, women have bad experiences, yeah? So like my colleague was saying, Ms. Demo was saying, on a construction site, you may have experiences that, I mean, are inappropriate. You do have situations, you know, we have this saying in the Caribbean, somebody said that to me, one, the construction site is the one place where you can leave prison and get a job. If you're on a site where you have characters who are probably, um, you know, <laughs> they've just come from prison, there's a possibility you're going to get harassed, right? And, and, and what I would suggest is, you see, what, what's the, I mean, you, you tell me, if, if, if a woman goes on site where she has to interact with persons who are not part of a company who's probably behaving inappropriately, what, does that fall under the category of inequality? I, I'm asking because I'm not sure to what extent we could define that as, as an inequality problem. Yeah, I think so because men wouldn't face that. So that's that's an inequality because you're a woman facing that. Men don't have to worry about showing up and then figuring out what am I going to wear to the construction site. You know, is are these jeans too tight or you know are these too loose? Women have to worry about additional. Like, okay, okay. So in, in that sense, I mean, I, I suppose I mean the way that because of my experience in the Caribbean, I just I, I mean it's such a part of the experience. I mean, I, when I talk about the sort of the gender based violence, I mean this is not actually. Um, sort of direct attack or physical attack. I mean, and it, but it's probably just part of the, the bigger problem. I never actually used to think about that as, as an inequality issue. I really thought about it as a HSE issue, almost. <laughs> I mean, it's a gender HSE issue because you're going in a space where it's probably not as safe as you need it to be. I always thought about it in the context, I would only sort of feel unsafe if I'm actually working with people who my direct colleagues, the company that I work with, have the practices where I feel unsafe. Yeah. Um, but I can, I, I mean, I know that you've made it clear. I think I'm, I'm clear about where we're going with that. So certainly I agree with you. Our construction site is a space where you do have a problems, problems where um, the, you know, you could have these situations that, you know, that come up that, you know, are really uncomfortable. The, what, what I say to young women is that you're probably not going to, you're probably going to have to continue dealing with that because of the way it is. So what you need is strategies, right? I always believe in strategies. We have to find solutions. We can't, I mean, a lot of the times if the situation exists and you can't change the situation, you have to be able to deal with it. And I think a lot of our young women, you know, they learn the tools and they cope quite well, right? The other thing I would mention here is mentorship. 
for more technical fields, I think one of the one of the challenges, and it's an issue facing both men and women. I think I see a lot of cases where 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 we don't get the benefit of enough mentorship and support. You will do better if you have support. You will do better, if, especially in a highly technical field. Again, I mean, I, I think I'm super lucky, but I had male mentors who were excellent. And gender was never an issue. They cared about their employees and they worked hard to make sure we improved at a technical level. If women don't have support, especially when there are a lot of demands, but not enough support, in technical fields, you tend to see women sort of dropping off because you can't, it's hard to progress in your career without that support. And that's a problem I think that we face in the Caribbean. So highly technical fields is one area where you see it a little bit. And on construction site, yes, you see that as well. You see those, you know, you see that kind of behavior. The other thing I'll mention is this, and I think it's really, really important, is that a lot of there are lots of situations, and women often don't talk about it very openly, but if you talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, they tell you the stories. There are lots of situations in a work environment where women actually have experiences with colleagues that are inappropriate that would fall under probably sexual harassment or something along those lines. And they might have official company policy that would talk about how to address those issues, but the reality of addressing it is a lot more complicated because of backlash. And therefore, it's, it, those, those experiences that I, I think, unless you actually drag it out of women, they're not necessarily going to talk about it because they understand it's an environment where they pay a higher price if they express their view. And sometimes things get miscommunicated and confused. And sometimes there's a lot of things that go on that you know it's not right, but you can't find the language for it. You can't, you don't have an organizational policy where people, you know for sure you, people will respect you, respect that you have a valid issue here. And therefore they try to, you know, women try to navigate that on their own using the tools that they have. Um, I, I'm lucky I enough that I didn't have to deal with that, but I've heard stories and it, it is a problem. I want to take the last two minutes um, because Ms. Trotter made a segue into the last question of mentorship. So I would like you all to, you know, talk about your experiences. She's already spoken to this point um, about mentorship, whether you had mentorship, whether there was cross mentorship, whether there was cross race mentor mentorship um, in the relations. Um, so if you could speak to that a little and then we would wrap up this sec section because we still time is running out and we still have to have the question and answers where we feel the questions um, and, and, and try to to respond to the participants' um, um, contributions. So let's hear from um, Dr. Allard first in terms of mentorship, and then we'll do a one minute wrap up of three of you all. No problem, thanks. So in terms of mentorship, I have uh, I've received mentorship from a variety of persons over my career. And um, it has generally been a mix of you know, based on the environment, it naturally happened. It just kind of started to happen after some conversation. We realized that we are um, we're communicating in a way that is beneficial in both ways. And in some cases, I've actually seek, you know, and tried to find somebody who I think can mentor me. Right? Um, now I can't speak to whether that has has been the case for the women that I've seen in the environment where I've been. Um, I don't think it's a common thing to have mentorship naturally happen in different environments, right? I think it's something you need to seek if you want to progress in a certain way for your career or your life generally. And I think mentorship doesn't necessarily have to be the boss or the professor or whoever it is who's above you. It could also be a peer who has some experience yes, that you don't have, right? And I think you really do need to think uh, in the way that Mr. Tata said, you have to be strategic about it, right? Pick somebody and, you know, you don't know when you're now starting out if that person is even interested in taking on a bit of responsibility in being a mentor. So, you know, start to have a conversation, you know, as I say, feel them out, you know, have a conversation, see if there, there's a common ground that these discussions are valuable in both ways and, and go from there and feel free to move around to different people. And of course, you can have multiple mentors. 
So yes. I've had mentors in different fields at the same time. Um, it doesn't have to be a very structured thing. It could be, I realize that this person has some immense knowledge that I can learn from. It doesn't have to be in everything, all right? Um, I like to get the value in the field of competence of that person. I think the area that that person specializes in or has excellent experience in, engage in all of that. Man, woman, doesn't really matter, all right? And I think it's very, very valuable in all fields, honestly. So um, I'd encourage that. I would say it does need some, some curation work on the side of, I would say, the, the mentee, right? Mm -hmm. And yes. I would say even on the side of the mentor, you know, it, it's valuable for mentors to mentor to, of right? Because you, you, you learn a lot you know, about yourself, about others. You learn to empathize and interact with others. So it's very valuable to do that. And, you know, if you reach a certain point in your career where you feel you have something else to give back, I think it's beneficial to try to just start talking with the other persons around you who you think could use at least a conversation and see where it goes. Great. Thank you for that. And I want to add to that discussion. And in these times of COVID, um, we have the discipline now of the new um, e-mentoring. So you don't have to be face to face to have discussions, but a check in um, at a regular point in time will also do so. So that's a very um, important and valid um, contribution you've made. Let's, let's end this mentoring discussion with Ms. Demo's contribution and then one minute to wrap up and then we move to the next step of, of or the next stage of this round table. So um, I'll keep this one brief. So, you know, in, in the real engineering world, um, you know, uh, men will be mentoring females entering the field more than women because, you know, there's not that many women in those, um, in those positions. So there is a need for men to better understand um, the struggles that a female will face during the career. And, um, and it's really important to have a, a male mentor, if, you know, if, if he is a male, to have a mentor who um, who actually is interested in, in making sure that you progress in your career because the problem that you know you can face with having a male mentor and being a female is that people will not go directly to the mentor and make trouble they will you know they will treat the woman more badly because they feel like she's being favored you know because she has a mentor she's a female you know and I got lucky to have um, my supervisor as my mentor so you know it's I was lucky enough to have somebody that guided me throughout the whole way and stuck up for me and really, you know, uh, was really transparent with everything going on because that allows you to, to really be uh, an engineer that, you know, you, you, whenever you can mentor the next person, you know exactly like um, how to do it properly yes. to avoid, you know, continuing this, this, this uh, gender inequality in this field. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Demo. I just want to take the opportunity to say we are, uh, clearly behind time, but what we have certainly seen is how diverse, how complex, how many things we have to unpack. We have to even think about where it starts because for example, one of you all, um, Ms. Strata, I think it is, you, you talked about the fact that, that sometimes you don't recognize that it's inequality. So we have to even go to the stage of identifying what it is before we could even think of addressing it, let alone preventing it. So I want you all to wrap up with just one, um, one minute of what is your take in terms of how can we move forward in addressing inequality or, or, or let me take the positive side, making it more equal for women in engineering. I'll start with Ms. Trotter. Um, so one of the things that, um, that I know, I mean, ab absolutely, absolutely, I'm, I'm sure about this, is that... Um, and I have to keep you to your one minute because we <laughs> Okay, okay, I, I will move fast. <laughs> um, is that it starts with, it really starts with company culture, yeah? Because what happens is that we have, we have women who, you know, there, there may be situations where um, you find things that are not quite right. But you can correct it if it is that you have an organization that has policy that look at gender issues and look at how to protect women. Yeah. So if you are in, a, in, a, in an organization where they, they, there's clear policy, but not just policy written on paper, but training and support for both men and women of, of what it means, what, what respect means, 
and how if you come from a slightly different society or different background that in some in some in some societies if you put your hand on somebody's shoulder it's not a big deal mm -hmm. for other people that's a pretty big deal you cannot touch you know you cannot touch them and it's it's, it's a scandal right and and for me i that sense sensitivity training has to be ongoing it's not about blame it's not about making people uncomfortable it's just part of trying to make the work environment better um is my minute up yes <laughs> thank you okay thanks thank you thanks a lot we'd go to miss demo so i would have to say that um you know like uh employees need to under or employers need to understand the the difference and of equality and equity. Um, you know, equality is, uh, we, you know, we want to treat everybody the same. Equality is the goal. Equity is, you know, proportional representation of, um, of, in our case, gender to have those same opportunities. So I think that like, for example, if everybody in the company got a raise, I mean, if, if the guy is still getting paid more than the female, then that's still inequality, you know? So I think that we have a, a company needs to have proper training on equality and equity and learning the difference. So equality is the goal and equity, you know, would attract more talent and it would retain employees longer to ensure a stronger future for the company. Thank you. Moving straight to Dr. Allard. Thank you. So I have three Final points minute. I want to make. No problem. Three points quickly. So uh, gender equality is important for society, all right? It's important for, as was said earlier, productivity of companies, productivity of all aspects of society, building things, uh, especially in engineering, at least. Um, it's also important for, for women themselves to be able to fully contribute, right? And fully express themselves. Course, they yeah. want to create things, they want to express their, use their talent, et cetera. We want to make sure that they're able to do that in a very welcoming environment. And teams are stronger these days when they have these diversities of views, right? So that's actually a good thing for everybody, right? Um, we need teamwork for getting all of these large engineering projects off the ground, so we need to have that. That's the first point. Second point, gender equality does not mean the same number of women in each field as men. It means the same opportunities, right? So if a woman wants to be a civil engineer, she should have the full opportunities as any man to do that, right? Yes. Um, and of course, you know, that, that's not the case now. So the final point is that men can be allies in this, right? I think that there are several things for men at many, multiple levels in organizations can do. If you're a leader of an organization, I think you can ensure that, you can almost do an audit, right? You can ensure that the women and men on your teams and your organizations have similar opportunities, they have been evaluated in similar ways, they have similar trajectories of their career, similar pay structures, et cetera, right? And that's something that can be done basically right away. Um, that's one. Two, if you're not a leader, or whether you're a leader or not, honestly, I think you can challenge any of those snide comments that you may hear men make, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they might be in confidence, they might be in small groups of only men or mixtures, and sometimes you know those comments are wrong. You can hear there's some underlying assumption from disrespect of the woman in the team, right? I think just challenging them, just asking them, what do you mean by that? Just yes. that alone yes. sometimes can make a huge difference in the long run, right? Yes. And the final point I would say, uh, I think men can support women in their careers. Like we talked about earlier, mentorship, you know, that can be done at all levels. So I would say those are my final comments. Thanks. Thank you very much. And thank you to our esteemed panelists uh, for such a, a very rich discussion um, with lots of topics, lots of issues, lots, to, lots of concepts to unpack. Um, but as we said, and I can't help but reiterate, this is the first of a series of discussions on the topic of gender and gender equality. So I will now hand you over to Ms. Nalini Kalimak and Dr. Lee Leon, who will be uh, coordinating the question and answer segment um, for the panelists, including myself. Thank you. Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. Hi, yes, good afternoon, can. everyone, and thank you again for being here. Excellent discussion. I can sit quietly here and just listen to this all day, every day. Um, so let's get into the questions really, really quickly in the essence of time, okay? Now, we've got a question here that I would love to address specifically to you, Dr. Jones Morales, and to Ms. Trotter, okay? It goes like this. 
is there an existence anywhere, an association or associations of female engineers? And do you see the value of such a grouping at the national and wider regional level? They can, among other things, do outreach to schools to inspire women when in the future field of engineering or future women in the field of engineering. So enlighten us a little bit. Any one of you can go first, Dr. Morales first or Ms. Trotters. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Ms. Telemark, for asking that question. I must say it's a difficult question for me <laughs> in the sense that I don't specifically know of mm -hmm. any um, association of female engineers. What I do know is that in Trinidad and Tobago, there are groupings or associations of female managers, um, female executives, there's AFET, um, there, there is PLOT, um, Powerful Ladies of Trinidad and Tobago, um, mm -hmm. but I don't know specifically of engineers. Uh, so I will have to just to, to ask Ms. 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 Trotter <laughs> if she is aware of such an organization in Trinidad and Tobago. No, not in Trinidad. I'm not aware of an organization like that in Trinidad. They, I mean, they're international organizations, Society of Women Engineers. They are international groupings um, of, of, of um, organizations that support women. My, I, my personal experience, I haven't joined any, so I don't, know, I, I don't know enough about them to have any kind of meaningful input on that. Okay. But I would Thank also so add um, for, for the interest, in the interest of the question, which is a very right. valid one, what we can do is we can do some research and by the time we come to webinar Correct, two, because this is a series, we, so we can yeah, bring it we back. Can, we can provide the information because we don't want people to feel that their questions are not taken seriously, but that we would provide the information after research because we just didn't think of it before coming to this session today. Yeah, I agree. Totally. But thanks yes, for the question. Good question. Thank you. Another one. So Dr. Allard. This one is specifically directed to you, and it goes like this. Female engineers are sometimes referred to as aggressive, while their male counterparts are referred to as assertive and go-getters. How would you advise female and male engineers to change those labels? Hmm. That's a tricky one. Do you want me to repeat the question or are you good? I, I got it. I got it. Okay. Um, yeah, I think um, yeah, that language is, is unfortunate. Um, it might be possible if, if the, well, I think the leaders can, the leaders of these organizations, because they, they are the ones that kind of set the tone, the culture of the organization. Absolutely. Right? And I think in discussions, internal discussions and projects or whatever it might be, that's when that kind of language is used. Oh, he's assertive, she's you know, aggressive, right? Mm -hmm. And I think they have a huge opportunity anytime that happens to change that discussion, to change the language used. So, because we know that there's some underlying assumptions in the use of that language, right? Or at least you can try to see if there is, because maybe, maybe it's a very, um, generic use of the term and there wasn't any management, right? But I think the leaders of the organizations can, use, can play a huge role in changing that by just questioning, oh, what do you mean by astute? What do you mean by aggressive? Absolutely. You know, she's making her point. He's making his point, you know? Uh, we, we like that, right? You both to make your points in these discussions because we like openness because ideas mm -hmm. are what change the world, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that's a good way for that to happen. But even at lower levels, I think that if someone is, let's say, on a team where somebody else uses that kind of language, they can also kind of question it, or they can deliberately do the reverse, right? Oh. So say, okay, well, she's being assertive. That's great, you know? Even in general discussion, even before presentation or something formal, informal discussion, make sure the language is used commonly so that it's not a shocker when it's in a formal setting. And I think that helps a lot. And that, of course, happens not just within engineering firm, but outside also. Absolutely. I agree totally. Thank you for your input. Ms. Demo, <laughs> this question is for you. Looking back at your undergrad, on, on, looking back at your undergraduate engineering journey, do you think the syllabus or courses introduced or highlighted the issues of gender equality 
or empathy? Not at all. I think yeah. that it was it was a topic that was never discussed and not even just like um, talking about like, you know, my, my college experience, even in high school, I think there was a lack of exactly, you know, what's how to prepare, um, you know, mm -hmm. women for this. I think a lot of the things that um, my perceptions of what I was going to experience when I got to that point in my career was just based on stereotypes. I figured that that's what was going to happen because that's, you know, that when you, that when you, you know, are trying to find a career, you do the research on it, you know, um, the woman in engineering is, is a high topic. So I found a lot of information that, you know, online that prepared me for what I was going to experience versus, you know, having that transparency in undergrad to say, oh, this is, you know, what you're going to go through and you're going to have to work harder and, you know, you're going to have to be tough and, you know, like leave the, the, Feminine, I'm going to say like femininity, you have to, you have to leave that behind. You have to basically be a go-getter, whether, you know, you're prepared or not. You're kind of just thrown out there and you have to just, um, yeah, yeah. So it was, it was never, I was never prepared. Just thrown in the ocean and swim. <laughs> <laughs> but in a good way though, because I think that that also helps us become better engineers. You know, working hard is benefiting us, you know, so it's, it's, it's not a bad thing, I wouldn't say, in regards to that aspect. Okay. Thank you so much for your input. Now, this question is for everyone on the panel, okay? Feel free to answer any, any, anyone that wishes to do so, okay? And it goes like this. How much of the issues related to retention of a woman in engineering stem from the toxicity of academia and the microaggressions of a woman? Anyone on the panel, the floor is yours. Feel free to answer the question. Can you repeat if the not, question? I'll call names. Yeah. <laughs> Ms. Strutter, Ms. Strutter, oh, sure, I'll repeat the question. Yes. Yeah. How much of the issues related to retention of a woman in engineering stem from the toxicity of academia and the microaggressions of a woman? Um, Anybody? Well, I mean, I, I, I mean, okay, so... I, I don't, I don't see that. I don't okay. see when they talk about toxicity in ac. What's the word toxicity in what? Of academia. What does that mean? I think it's you know, like okay. So I mean, we, we, I, one of the struggles I have with gender issues, yeah. And again, I'm not going to take long on it. Is that I mean, I'm a, I'm a woman, and I care about advancement of women. But sometimes there is language that's very loaded and I don't understand its place in the discussion. So I don't, I need, I, I, I'm probably Dr. Morales can explain to me that expression. What does that mean? Dr. Morales? I will have to ask what does which one mean because the, the, the question itself is loaded. In terms when is it toxicity in academia? What does that mean? I think I think it's a, ne a negative impact of of education that is not allowing for the woman. At least that's my interpretation for the for the woman to trans transfer into their their specific careers. That the the education is not in favor of the woman moving to the, the next step of having a career path in um, engineering. In engineering, I I, I agree. In part, though, you know, I think it's an unconscious uh, thing. So it's like, for example, in um, in high school, where or even you know, in the, in the in the previous education, we're required to take courses in arts and crafts, you know, and to, to develop our you know, like our characteristics of who we're who we're growing up to be. We don't have those requisite, you know, those requirements to for engineering or anything like in terms of STEM. Yes, we have science and we have like the basic math, but we don't really have. Uh, like I don't think engineering is just the basics of uh, physics and science that we learn in, in, in high school. It's way more. And we don't, you know, we don't um, like the curriculum, you know, and especially in the U.S. is not do a, a good enough job of, 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 of basically explaining what engineering actually is and giving students the opportunity to experience, um, you know, what they will experience in engineering if they do decide to go that route. Like, just like we, you know, we do arts, crafts, science, math, I think there needs to be a specific type of course that could, you know, help reduce some of these stereotypes that engineering is just for men and engineering is just blacks and engineering is just physics because engineering is way more than that. There's so many more. I just, 
I just wanted to add something here, right? Um, and again, I, I don't want to risk being con I don't want to risk thanks. I mean, Ms. Demo has a good point about the exposure. The question I would ask, though, is that are women disadvantaged in any way from the lack of exposure? Yeah. Is it that we can do more? In, is, it, is it because that has not been my experience in the Caribbean? I don't think women are disadvantaged from exposure to engineering. I think if when at high school level and even at university level, the experience I've had, I mean, I, I'm not saying that that's not your experience. It might very well be your experience. I'm not sort of suggesting that that's not your experience, but in the, in the CARICOM region, and again, probably my understanding of gender issues probably just don't go far enough. But I, I really strongly believe that we have to be very careful about making things gender issues when they're probably not in our, in our experience. So in the Caribbean, can, do we have examples to, that, where, we could, where we could make the case with evidence that women are subjected to a toxic or less than ideal, not enough access up to university level? In, in STEM. I can, I can categorically say we can get those figures. I can categorically say that because there are lots of STEM um, programs around um, in the sense that we know that um, Shell, I think it is, they but have- But are, are women, the question is, are women disadvantaged in any way? In terms well, of access to those opportunities, I think women, I haven't seen any situation, you know, where even, I mean, even when I, I mean, in the experiences I had with high schoolers, I think, boy, I think boys and girls up to A-levels and even at university level have pretty equal access. Well, I don't think so. That's I think, as I said, as, as I said, I'm sure we could, we could find out what, what, why there is the disconnect between being in a, a program and not translating into doing it at the level of university and also Correct. going into to engineering as a career. I think we could, we could get those figures. That, that is without a doubt. Because worldwide figures show that there, there is a, a, a disconnect. Um, I think it was um, studies in Sweden, and, and I'll check my, my, my source in a, in a little bit, which said that there is a disconnect. There are studies to show that, and I'm sure we could pull those figures for Trinidad and Tobago. So ostensibly, it, it may look as though there is equal access, but there must but be some reason that it is not translating into careers. Absolutely, absolutely. And that is, that is a fact. That's one of, that's one of the questions that we will have to come back to. Is that something that Allah is speaking? Before you move on, can I make a quick point? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah, so sure. it'd be particularly interesting to see that data, Ms. Jules-Morales, since we, we see constantly, every single year, that women, girls are doing much better than boys in school, yeah. right, in almost all fields. Um, they're copying all the awards, you know, the national awards every year, and, you know, in universities in Trinidad and Tobago, we know that there's a large factor, a more than that is, uh, you know, that are women taking degrees, right? So I'd like to see how that translates also. When we're able to get that data, thanks. Well, this is this is going to be a, a continuing discussion. So I'm yes. certain that upon the next discussion, we can we can go through it again in more detail. Yes. So, yes. Dr. Alados, you're here. Okay. This one is for you. We are talking about a more gender-based society, but a perfectly gender-neutral society is impossible due to biological differences between men and women. How do we define the ideal or the idea, well, the ideal um, vision for gender balance in the society? How do we define the ideal vision for gender balance in the society? That's a tricky one. <laughs> I feel like I'm getting some very tricky ones today. Um, you're the only, you're the only male in the discussion, so I, know, I need to, keep, I need to the keep the questions balanced. They, they feel sorry for me. Thank you for your sympathy. <laughs> um, okay, well, I think um, we need to have things like these, these kind of discussions. Yes. Right? Because you can only solve these deep societal problems with discussion, right? Open discussion, very frank, very respectful discussion, right? 
Now, the, the biological differences are a fact, right? That's, um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, there's a suggestion that it's a bad thing. I mean, women bring forth life. We love that, right? That's great. Um, men are different. But I think, you know, uh, as we all know, we all need each other, right? In terms of the productivity issue that Ms. Strutter indicated, I think that's where it becomes tricky. So men are able to continue working, even during, you know, uh, as the man gets a child in his family, you know, he's able to continue working. Now, physically, there's no difference. But I think we also have discounted the need for the man to be excused from work to support the growing child, you know, um, parents to leave, right? That's something that only certain parts of the world, uh, Dr. Jose Morales mentioned, Scandinavia, for instance, right? That is very fully respected there that the man and the woman, they get the mother and the father, they get time off, you know, for maternity, right? And it, I think it's more or less equal. In other parts of the world, that's not the case. So that has to be a part of the discussion too. To what extent do we want to have a distinction between the time provided for men and women to, to rear their families? But that's still a separate question to what Ms. Trotter also indicated regarding, you know, you just have in, immense needs as a parent, especially as a woman, to nurture a newborn child, right? So these are physical needs. They are changes in the society globally of how, how we encourage and how we respect people that are taking care of their kids while they're working, right? So there was a, a lot of news of one or two years ago about a European member of parliament who had her child, she was nursing while she was in the, in the, in the parliament, while she was working, right? We had examples of a gentleman who was being interviewed by BBC and his kids came in the room while the interview was happening. Oh, I remember that. Exactly, right? Mm -hmm. So we're seeing that, you know, parents and the kids, they, it bleeds into the work life. So I think we have to have a very open and frank discussion about what aspect of that do we want to enable and allow for the good of society globally, and what aspect we need to say, no, there's a barrier, we need to not cross this barrier for when your family life bleeds into the work and the productivity that's needed. But we can't do it without open and frank discussion. That's a key part of that discussion too, is putting yourself in the other person's shoes. Right? So what's needed from your company, from your boss, you have to understand that they have bills to pay, they have productivity to meet, they have output to deliver for their clients. And at the same time, that company has employees which have families. Right? So I think it needs to be very open and frank, and I think we can do that in Trinidad and Tobago and in the Caribbean in a way that is unique to our needs right here. Absolutely. Awesome, awesome, awesome answer. That was great. Now, another panel question, feel free to answer anyone or everyone. It goes like this. Do you think there is an underlying assumption or bias in companies that lead to delegating more management secretarial tasks to women in engineering positions, more so than technical tasks? Have any of the engineers on this panel observed or experienced this? And I think we were talking about this earlier a little bit. Anyone on the panel? Anyone? So I would say that, you know, engineers, you. <laughs> I would say that engineers early, um, early in our trainings, uh, it's kind of like, I would say that we learned that there's two skills required, you know, it's hard engineering skills, like uh, your technical ability and problem solving. And it's a softer, you know, professional skills like communication, you know, like building relationships and teamwork and kind of being the pro like a managing the project. So, you know, I think that these skills are definitely gendered. Um, more so in the sense of, you know, if you want somebody to be like, I feel like women are, are better at communicating just as just as a stereotype. So, you know, because of this, um, they prefer that women go into that management role and then which would, which wouldn't technically be project man, like technical project management, it would essentially be, um, you know, director where they deal with the budget and they deal with everyday engineering activities where it's not, where it's not really delegated to the technical design questions. And I can say from my experience, every every project manager that I've worked with who has been 
in that level of um, technical expertise has been male. And then every woman that, are, you know, does have experience in engineering, they are, you know, that are high up, they're more, they're like the directors and then the overall like managers of everything. So I, I personally haven't um, seen that. And that actually makes me want to be like a woman that's uh, like, you know, in the technical side of things and continues to stay in that route throughout my career. Thank you for your input. Anyone else? No one else? <laughs> okay, great. Well, if no one else wishes to answer the question, um, I would like to thank each and, every, each and every one of you for your input, especially to, to the participants for the questions. Um, unfortunately, we were unable to answer all of the questions that were asked, but best believe that we will review them. And again, because this is an outgoing, um, ongoing discussion, we will bring answers to everyone here the following time, okay, next time. Well, with nothing else to add, I would love to reintroduce Dr. Jones Morales. Please take the floor, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Talimak, uh, for moderating the session, which you did so brilliantly. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we want to leave you all with some takeaways, because I think it's important at, at interventions such as these that you take something away that you could act on, think about more, um, have further discussion, research more, and that kind of thing. So now I will ask for us to have a slide on some takeaways that we want to leave with you, and then we will have the, the close off for this session. Thank you. Okay, so we have just about eight um, webinar takeaways for today. Um, firstly, <clears throat> we, we ask you all to be transparent. I think that's one of the suggestions and, and people are asking about the gender statistics and getting them. And just to say that um, I checked my, my source and I saw that the study was in fact in, in Sweden and, and Tunisia. And they said that um, only 20% of the girls there, they move from having the STEM training and moving into careers um, along the STEM um, career path. So just for, for information. So it's important to look at the statistics, unpack the data, and as well to properly and, and seriously analyze the data and to come up with reasons why, why you have different phenomena and as well to suggest um, solutions or how to formulate strategies to move forward. The second thing is to support women into more senior roles. Um, make sure that the women have same access to opportunity uh, reassess job requirements for the senior, um, for the senior leadership um, team. And <clears throat> there's, no, there's no hiding that women still have not made um, a, a serious dent into the leadership roles in organizations. Um, studies have shown, and I'm not specific to engineering companies, but worldwide it's just about 5% of women really take on serious um, leadership roles on, on, on boards. So third one, training the unconscious bias. That is something that is steeped and deep rooted in our, in our culture. Um, and people need, as, as we saw with Dr. Trotter, people need to get the training um, to even recognize um, that there are, there are biases and, and unconscious so. so it has to do with your socialization. How are we socialized? And I think it's important. I think one of the points that Dr. Allen made was that, yes, it is not about the dollhouse versus the, the trucks. You can, be an, you can see engineering opportunities in both. Um, so it's, again, a requirement that we have a little more open-mindedness as we go about um, dealing with tackling gender inequality. Uh, we should have clear policies on discrimination, and I would have had here not only discrimination, but on discrimination and bias. Clear on bias, non-retaliatory discrimination policies, 
that ensure that people have a safe place to comment, to report inappropriate treatment in the workplace. And in some organizations, you send that very clear message by having a zero tolerance um, policy on things like sexual harassment, um, whistleblowing, which also has a, and could have a gender bias attached to it. Um, fifthly, uh, to provide flexible working hours and destigmatize shared parental leave. So some organizations worldwide are in fact making strides in terms of allowing fathers to have just as, 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 as well, I shouldn't say just as many, but more than they usually had. So in, in, in my organization, I think it used to be um, five, five days um, when I joined many years ago, and now it's, it's a month for, for um, paternal leave. So making strides there. Actively encouraging women to progress, making sure that employees of every gender are applying for promotions and asking for, for pay rises and, and, and getting the space in which to do that. Um, <clears throat> so that women can progress. Seventh, promote a culture of meritocracy. Promote a culture where great ideas come from all levels, genders and races, and all voices are welcome and respected around the table. And for the work of Cheryl Schanberg, you said, lean in at the table, let your voice be heard. Sometimes we as women, we want to be too coy, we are afraid, we are concerned about what would they say if we seem to be aggressive and as somebody talked about just now micro aggressive um so you know it's, it's it's just layers on layers we have to give everybody a fair chance and and these things again as i said before are steeped in our culture finally make sure that everyone has access to mentors and i think the point came out this afternoon that it is not necessarily for a mentor to see you or identify you or 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 or, or or make sure that they see something in you that they want to develop. Again, Cheryl Sandberg said in her book, Lean In, you can go out there and ask for someone to be a mentor. And I have a, a particularly <clears throat> interesting experience of a female CEO in Trinidad and Tobago, who some weeks ago told me um, that, that sometime before COVID, she was, she was at Hilton and, and, and a woman, an employee came up and said, I would like you to be my mentor. And she said, well, you don't know me, I don't know you. And she, the woman said that, yes, I've been following you. So she was just waiting for the opportunity and she kept um, in contact with the lady, the exchange numbers and so. So sometimes we have to take a chance and take a chance to the extent that even if you are denied an opportunity on your first try, Try and try again until you succeed. So I think, ladies and gentlemen, we want to leave you with these clear webinar takeaways. Um, this is something you can, you know, take a screenshot. And <clears throat> what we are going to, to do is ask you to think and ruminate a little bit more on these issues uh, so that we can have more and more discussion of unpacking gender equality in engineering. So thank you for that. Um, it leaves only now for me to move the voter thanks. Um, you know, this was really a fantastic um, intervention this afternoon. We, at this time, are 19 minutes, <laughs> 19 minutes over time, but it speaks to the enthusiasm and the energy that people brought to the discussion. And so, and I hope that we were all able to share um, something that you could take away with and leave and say, okay, it was worth your while to spend the, the, the two hours here with us this afternoon. So let me get into it quickly, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of this very informative round table. And I truly must say it was a success. As I had mentioned in my introduction, this is the first of a series of conversations to share valuable insights on the topic of gender. 
It is an opportunity for the marriage between the social sciences and the hard sciences and provides us groundswell for a lot of new research in Trinidad and Tobago and the wider Caribbean. And I think that came out this afternoon in terms of getting statistics, probably even doing um, primary research to get information that we could share and have further um, deeper dives into the topic. So to Dr. Tongzen, we thank you for giving us your blessings to host such a webinar. Conducting this session with engineers lent a unique setting for addressing gender issues. To Dr. Lee Leon, the mastermind of this webinar, we remain in your debt. This forum provided an opportunity to stimulate people's thinking in immeasurable ways and increase the understanding on gender issues. Special commendation also goes to Ms. Leah Wright and Ms. Amna Ali for all of their help and support as they were working behind the scenes, providing invaluable commentary and advice. To Mrs. Wendy Maynard, we cannot thank you enough for your gracious assistance. Communication and marketing is your wheelhouse. And once again, I got the opportunity to see you in action, making sure that everything associated with the UE branding was perfect. Your efforts are greatly appreciated. To the panelists, Ms. Angina Binta Trotter, Dr. Ryan Allard, and Ms. Javina Demo, we owe a great debt of gratitude to you for all of the hours spent researching this topic and sharing your experiences, which totally enhanced the conversations today. I can safely say that everyone in, the, in attendance would have benefited in some way from what you have offered here. Having a mixed cadre of panelists, ladies and gentlemen, also allowed us to have different perspectives. And Ms. Demo and Dr. Allard were able to offer an international outlook while Ms. Trotter brought her wealth of knowledge as a senior engineer. We look forward to hearing more from all of you, all three of you, on the topic of gender in the future. Last but not least, I must extend our gratitude to Mrs. Nalini Telemac and Dr. Leon for their excellent moderation of the proceedings. You did a fantastic job and we are grateful for that. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to extend on behalf of the Department of Engineering, our sincere gratitude to the audience who provided the energy and enthusiasm and asked us challenging questions. We must say that today. We are very grateful for your participation and we hope that our takeaways would be down to your benefit through the formulation of concrete plans and strategies on how to move forward on this issue. I thank each and every one of you for taking the time from your very busy schedule to join us here this afternoon. We know that it is in this digital age that there are many choices of conferences, round tables, webinars, sessions, a plethora of opportunities that you have to choose from. And today you chose us. So we look forward to seeing you in the, in the future for our future interventions. I want to tell you, have a good afternoon and stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.